Um, hi, everybody. Thank you for attending today's Journey Through America's Newsrooms with Lakeland Now. Um, we are going to go ahead and pass it off to Barry Friedman, who is the founder, editor, and publisher of the publication. Hi. Well, thank you for inviting us, first of all. Happy to be here. Um, what I wanted to do is start out by giving about a 50,000 view uh, uh, look at who we are, what we do, and, and how we fit into the media environment. Then I'll talk a little bit about my background, and that will lead into a little bit more information about why we got started and, and what we do. So uh, Lakeland Now is a uh, independent, uh, community-driven news that covers hyperlocal news about Lakeland, Florida. Lakeland is a town of 107,000 uh, that's kind of midway between Tampa and Orlando. So right in the, uh, in the uh, central Florida I-4 corridor. Um, we are probably one of the smaller organizations that you're going to be hearing from. Right now, our staff is kind of two of us full time. Uh, I'm the editor and publisher, Trinity, who is also on the screen is our community engagement director. We have quite a few um, freelancers, and one of them who's supposed to be joining, John Hoagie, is uh, almost full time. He does, he's doing a real lot of good work for us right now. Um, we are in a growth mode. We're hoping to hire a full time reporter soon, and within a year, hopefully, a full time editor. So, um, to get into a little bit of background, let me just give you. Uh, just a, a brief background. I, I grew up in Atlanta, went to the uh, University of Florida, and that's where I became interested in, in journalism. Started working on the, the uh, school newspaper there. When I graduated, I was a reporter for a couple of years at the Tampa Times in Tampa. That's not the Tampa Bay Times, which is uh, currently the, the only uh, uh, daily newspaper in the Bay Area now. It was actually an evening paper that was owned by the Tampa Tribune Company. Um, I was there for about seven years. I was a reporter for two years and I became an assistant city editor and city editor. Uh, moved from there to here to Lakeland. I was hired as city editor then I was a uh, news editor and features editor. And around the uh, early 90s, I became really fascinated with the internet and decided that uh, it was kind of my mission to make sure that the ledger was one of the first newspapers to go online. So uh, we, we uh, we started working on a business plan for the website for, for the ledger.com in 1995. Unfortunately, it was 1998 by the time we launched. So we really weren't the first, but we were still in the first, first wave. Um, grew that quite a bit. We were up to 12 million page views a month uh, before they decided to put in a paywall. <laughs> the traffic plummeted after that. Uh, 2014, for various reasons, uh, they decided they didn't need anybody in my position anymore, mostly because by that time, um, let me back up, when, when we started uh, the ledger.com, the internet was brand new, a lot of people looked at it as experimental, they didn't know if the internet was going to stick around, it's kind of funny to think about that right now, but back then a lot of people thought it was a niche product, and um, Anyway, by, by 2014, it was very much a big part of the business and uh, corporate had taken it over. And any of the big decisions, any strategic decisions were made uh, by our owners at, at that time. Actually, at that time, we were owned by a company called Halifax Media. Before that, we had been a New York Times newspaper paper for about 40 years. Um, Anyway, they, they decided to do anybody in my position. It was time for me to look around for the next thing to do in my life. Uh, and something that kept occurring to me was a, a um, uh, focus group we had had while we were still a New York Times paper. And uh, this was a focus group with people in their 30s and 40s and 50s. They were professionals and, um, and small business owners who were very involved in the community, the kind of people who we thought would be our customers. They look like the people who typically would buy a daily newspaper. But we found out that uh, you know, one of the reasons, one of the main reasons a lot of them weren't uh, readers is they felt that if something big was happening in town, they would find it on uh, Facebook. And uh, to, to me, Facebook was a pretty inefficient way to get, uh, get local news. So my idea was to start a local news website 
that would uh, serve the, that sort of function the newspaper used to serve of being the glue that held the community together, that let people know what was going on, that got people involved in their community. And uh, we wanted to be mobile first. Uh, this was, again, it was 2015 that we launched. So I knew that mobile was important. We wanted to be very involved locally with social media because that was very important at that time. And, uh, and we launched. Now, one of the things we did that uh, is a little, bit, a little bit different is we launched as a nonprofit. So um, we are part of a movement that you'll find of small independent uh, news organizations covering, in some cases, a small town, and in other cases, a very niche area. It might be the environment, it might be healthcare in a region. But anyway, niche publications, most of them local, um, and usually starting pretty small. So we're, we're a member of two organizations. One is Lion Publishers. Lion stands for Local Independent Online News Publishers. I don't know the exact breakdown. My guess it's about 75% of the members, and there's about 400 members. And I'd say about 75% are for profit, 25% nonprofit. The other organization is the Institute for Nonprofit News. Obviously, those are all nonprofit sites. Uh, we're a little bit of an anomaly there. Most of the members start out pretty, pretty much larger than we are. They uh, typically start out with you know, maybe some foundation funding. They typically cover a municipal area or a state, or in some cases, a topic like education. Chocolate would be an example of that. Some of the big names would be the Texas Tribune, uh, Men Post in Minnesota. Again, kind of statewide, big, big publication. So in some ways, uh, we feel a little bit um, out of the mainstream there, right? Because because we, we, we're a much smaller organization. That's a little bit about kind of how we got our start. Our start. Um, uh, one of the questions I was asked to write is, do we have a dedicated staff of contributing writers? And uh, right now I'm the only full-time writer. We do have, as I said, probably about a half dozen freelancers. And uh, as far as the story assignments, I'd say it's probably about half and half between stories that I, uh, uh, I pitched to them and stories they pitched to me. So um, one of the uh, one of our freelancers, uh, Stephanie Claytor, is a former TV reporter, and she, you know, one of the things I actually appreciated about Stephanie when she was covering uh, news locally on TV is that she's very enterprising and found a lot of stories that the other TV stations didn't have, and she's still doing that for us. She's coming up with she comes up with some really good ideas. Um, Let's see, overview of a typical day at Lakeland now. Uh, that's interesting. We, do, in addition to our original reporting about Lakeland, we do uh, curation of news. So curating to me is finding the credible and impactful and interesting articles that other people do about Lakeland and sharing them with our readers. So one of the first things I do in the morning is uh, fire up my computer. I look at the uh, the daily paper in town that I used to work for. Unfortunately, they're a lot smaller than they used to be. At one point, 1998, there were 98 people in the newsroom. Um, and now they're down to about 13, 15, something like that. So uh, unfortunately, they're not as strong as they used to be. They don't have quite the, the impact, uh, but I've, I've got a kind of routine I go through looking at the various Tampa TV stations, Google News, uh, some other some social media feeds, and uh, based on that, uh, do some curation. If, if you look at, uh, at Lakeland Now right now, lkldnow.com, you'll see kind of a mix of our own stories and curated stories. So the most recent one is one that John Hoagie wrote, really a pretty in-depth piece about a local controversy about duck hunting on a local lake. Um, you'll see that uh, uh, <laughs> the local residents are a little bit uh, uh, perturbed and maybe frightened of, uh, of uh, weapons going off pretty close to their homes on a, uh, they live right on the lake shore in a residential area. Uh, hunting groups, of course, say they've got a legal right to be there and they're not backing down. In fact, they're kind of they're going to double down when duck hunting season opens again this fall. 
Uh, so that was one. We had another story that Stephanie did about a local woman who got an award. But there's two stories before that are examples of curated. One is the fact that um, uh, today was supposed to be the last um, spring training game for the uh, Detroit Tigers who have their spring training here. At the last minute last night, uh, the Tigers and the Baltimore Orioles did not announce kind of at the last minute that, oh, we, we don't have enough pitchers. We're just going to cancel the game. We're going to go back to Detroit and Baltimore and start our season. So did a little thing on that. That was kind of a combination of my own reporting, but mostly from one of the Detroit uh, uh, TV stations. And then I did do something occasionally called Read It in the Morning Paper, and I summarized uh, three articles from, uh, from the morning paper today. So that's kind of a, a, an example of our, the mix of our coverage and probably a pretty, pretty good example of a uh, kind of combination of the curation and the, um, the, the um, locally uh, originated reporting. Uh, one of the things that has changed a lot since we started is when, when I started Lakeland now in 2015, I really didn't have the staff of uh, freelancers. So most of um, most of what I got, uh, most of the reporting was, was stuff that I did myself. I've become really more of an editor now that I've got people doing a lot of the reporting. So I do some reporting. Just got a, a note from John. He says he keeps getting a message that the meeting is not valid. Um, let me forward the most recent email I have to him just to make sure he's got, got the most recent. Give me a second here. While you're doing that, where's your oxygen? Where's the oxygen to get your, your visibility, your message? Because it's all about getting the oxygen. Um, Trinity, you want to take that one? Sure. I mean, I guess that what I'm hearing is how do we actually acquire an audience? Um, and I think fortunately, when I came in, Barry had already been at this for quite a few years and was already really well known in the community. So Lake Linnell was already building a reputation at that point for a place for quality locally driven news. And at the same time, our local paper of record has been kind of losing credibility over time. And so you know, we were really able to, to kind of capitalize this. And we don't have a paywall because we're a nonprofit, we are free. And so, you know, the content is easily accessible. So we were able to capitalize on a growing social media audience and social media feeds. But of course, I feel like that's shifting and changing now. We're not getting as much, you know, we're not getting as much reach on our social media, even though the audience has continued to grow because we're at the mercy of the algorithms. Um, so actually my Zoom meeting earlier today was because we're a nonprofit, we qualify for a Google uh, ads grant. And so, um, and through an initiative with the Google News Initiative, we've actually gotten some training. So we're actually able to get a significant amount of, of um, kind of grant money uh, loaded into a Google ads account so that we can actually drive traffic to the site through like the search network I've, on there. You tried an overnight email newsletter. I did this. We do have we we actually launched um we actually launched a weekly newsletter product um what, a daily, 20, daily daily we have daily news alerts and we have a daily news summary but we have a bespoke kind of um we're well not bespoke but we have a weekly news summary that's actually our premier one um that goes out every Thursdays and so that audience has been you know that audience has been building as well and so just to give you an idea, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, <laughs> but to give you an idea, so uh, Barry said this is a town of, you know, a little over 100,000 people in town, and we reach on average, our monthly unique users on average are about 60,000. Um, there's a lot more reach that we can do, but we're doing, you know, pretty well in terms of you know, the actual traffic to the site. Just give you an idea, I did this in Afghanistan. I started with one overnight email newsletter blast. I had a team of three at night, came in at 11 o'clock at night, and they went through all the news and then they put it into an email news blast in the morning. So I was one, I was the only email on the distro list March, 2017. Now there's 2.7 million on the email distro list. And in this email are links to the TV network, the radio network, and the metrics and the analytics say right now, because the Taliban are blocking, people are going to the phones, going to this email they get in the morning and watching TV, you're watching the news from 
that one initial email that they get in the morning at 8 a.m. Just something to think about. It works. It's very effective. So I would suggest maybe you get a list of all your people that are list, listening to you, going to your website, get their email, and start an overnight email blast that goes in everyone's email box at 8 a.m. in the morning. You'd be amazed how effective it can be. The strategy is immense, and it works. You know, uh, since you mentioned that, uh, one of the things, uh, one of the lessons learned, I would say, is, uh, you know, if I were to start over again, I probably would emphasize uh, the newsletter very much from the beginning. Uh, it really wasn't. Newsletters were just beginning to become prominent then. I knew they were around. I even included that in a lot of the presentations I made. Um, for whatever reason, I was kind of stuck on a website as our main publishing platform, but I, I've seen some really good things that have happened with newsletters that would probably be the way I would do it now if I were to start all over again. I can, send you, still... I can send you what we do. I get it in the morning at 8 a.m. I get it every morning at 8 um, my time at 10, 10 30 at night, which in Kabul, it's 8 a.m. in the morning. So every night I get this. It's very effective. Excellent. I'd love to see it. Yeah. Okay, good. One of the questions I was asked was, do you have any advice for journalists looking to join your team and or cover local news in general? And uh, that's something I've thought about a lot, um, you know, with the way that the news industry has contracted. I kind of wondered about um, the, the young people who go into journalism now and uh, you know, what will what will be there for them in the future? I think one of the things will be small, uh, uh, very focused local uh, organizations like ours. But the one thing I keep coming back to that I tell classes when I talk to, to at colleges is that, um, that that the main thing is to 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 learn the, the traditional skills of uh, of news gathering of uh, gathering the information, synthesizing the story and writing the story and telling the story. The technology will continually change. It's uh, the, the, the rate of uh, at which it's changed has just gone kind of bananas in the last couple of decades. But the, the tools are gonna change, but the overall storytelling uh, tools you use pretty much remain the same. Um, you know, I, I entered uh, newspapering at a time in the mid seventies when our main tools were basically text and black and white photos, right? We have an awful lot more than that now. We've got video and audio and databases and uh, live uh, streaming. So all kinds of tools we're using now that we didn't, couldn't even uh, even imagine back then. Still, the, the tools that we use in order to tell the stories really haven't changed that much. Just the, the, uh, the, the technology and the, uh, the, the actual, uh, you know, tools that have evolved. So I feel like I've done some of the talking. Uh, why don't we go to some of the uh, areas for Trinity and uh, John and, and uh, Len while, we're, while, while they're here. Sure. Okay. Well, I'm not oh. muted, so I'll just jump in here. Um, so my role within this organization, I have to say, I'm not a journalist. Um, I am the community engagement director. I don't think I have the inherent skepticism in order to be a journalist. Um, but I am, what I am is really an advocate for good journalism. And I started off in public uh, television, um, came right out of college and into PBS and then National Geographic and then the BBC and then got lured away by uh, CNN. And that was my first stint in for-profit media. So my heart, my soul belongs in nonprofit media. And when I met Barry and, and you know, he explained to me what he was doing, I knew I wanted to play a role in this. Um, so my role is really about, you know, helping to fund the organization and managing the operations and also communicating the mission. Um, so yeah, a couple of different hats there. Um, but it means that I get to like be a cheerleader and talk about the great work that Bear, the foundation that Barry laid and the great work that our journalists actually do. Um, so some of the questions that I uh, have here for me are, what role do you think community engagement plays in journalism? And this was something that 
really excited me about Barry's vision because starting off in broadcast, you know, the traditional version of broadcast is a very kind of linear, like we, the gatekeepers, you know, tell, you know, bro literally broadcast, you know, on mass to an undifferentiated audience, a set of facts. And there within that technology, that is a stream of information that goes only one way. But with all the new technologies that we have, we can create a new model of journalism that looks a lot more like an ongoing flowing conversation. And that's so much of what Barry had laid the groundwork for and created. And I thought that that was really exciting. So I think that's the big part that the, the community engagement plays within the journalism. And I see, um, I see a lot of what Lakeland now does as being the facilitator of conversations between kind of stakeholders, policymakers, the powers that be, and the community at large. We don't take positions, we don't advocate for positions, but we help connect the people who want to take a position or advocate to the information they need to have an informed opinion on that. Um, and then, uh, and jump in there if you have anything that you want to add to that. But um, this question is, how can journalists be more engaged with the communities that they're covering? I think this would probably be a good question for Len or for um, John to answer. Because like I said, I'm not a journalist, but the one thing I will say about that is, I think the important thing, especially after the last two years that, that we've learned is that while all this digital communication, all these different platforms are great, you cannot substitute real world engagement for online engagement. It, you know, they're not the same thing. I think uh, so much of the advantage of, that Lakeland now has is that Barry has been in this community for over 30 years covering. He's, you know, he's known here. Um, it's not a joke to say to say that Barry can sit at a coffee shop and like, you know, everybody just kind of comes up to him and gives him the news tips when he's out and about, you know, you have to go to the city commission meetings, you have to be seen there, you know, you just have to be part of the community. I know there's been a lot talked about about the whole concept of, you know, big national news organizations sending people who parachute in. And I think that if you rely too much on, you know, kind of digital media, it's going to end up affecting local journalism in the same way. It feels like you're just kind of parachuting into a community. And in a community like ours, when you're dealing with kind of smaller cities, you know, places that are, you know, less metropolitan, you're dealing with a lot of long-standing relationships. And it's really important to know where those bodies are buried, where those alliances are, and understand how everybody in the community fits together. And there's no other way to do that than to be out and part of the community. And I'm sorry, I talk with my hands a lot. <laughs> but um, all right, let me see what else we have here. Oh, uh, so what is like now doing to increase the involvement in the community? Well, one of the big things we are doing is we are expanding into doing more live events. Like I said, we are, you know, we're a digital publication. That's where we started. That's the roots of what we do. But I think it's important that we do have that real world engagement. And also people do just act differently in person. So if you, you know, at some point, you know, you get to a point where you start to worry that you're just kind of increasing the vitriol that's happening because it's nothing but Facebook comments or things like that. And I think bringing people literally in a, you know, back into a room together to talk things out feels a lot different and you can create really great dialogues that then you can turn around and post online and share and amplify, but you have to have that grounding in the real world scenarios. Um, we just did one on housing and homelessness, and we're planning another one in the fall that's going to be around smart growth. And these are both really, really contentious issues for our area. And I think we were able to have a really productive conversation um, around the housing and the homelessness issue. So do, you work with Pro, do you work with ProPublica at all? Um, do you work with them at all or not? We do not, no. No. I'd love to. They're a great organization. We love ProPublica. Um, but they do some really great investigative reporting. They do. Yes. Yeah, they do. They are also a member of INN. We are a member of INN, of INN as well, the, the uh, Institute for uh, Nonprofit News. Um, but no, they haven't had the chance to work with ProPublica. Um, 
So yep. the things that we do to spread the word about Lakeland now, I think I talked about them a little bit already. You know, I think the fact that we are freely accessible does help tremendously. Um, but we've been working on getting the word out there more and more. When I first started, a lot of it was social media driven and we have been moving more into other ways um, and ways to, to reach more low income communities has been a big part of this as well. Um, so we actually did an ad for our bus system with a QR code so that they can, you know, because the bus systems are actually Wi-Fi enabled, everybody has a, has a smartphone these days. So it was a way to reach lower income people who are right or uh, who are riding the bus and, you know, they make it easy for them, you know, to sit and read Lakeland now while, while they're, you know, getting to their destination. Um, in addition to the, you know, the, the community events that we've been doing and the Google AdWords. Um, yeah, I think that's, oh, this was an interesting question. I don't know if that was Barry's going to agree with my answer on this. Do you give feedback on articles that, give, that get published? And what do you look for when giving feedback? I don't think I really do, except to say I really like that article. <laughs> <laughs> and and John, I, I've been meaning to tell you, I actually really liked your article on the um, the 2011 law that like you know uh, limits the amount of power the city commission has on approving developments. Is John still on here? I saw him, but can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Can you guys yeah, hear me? Yes, yes we do. Yeah, we can hear you. First up, first of all, I, I was very uh, surprised to find Jack Pagano on this uh, thing, you know, Jack and I grew up two houses from each other. How did this happen? I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> uh, I mean, he actually took it on my screen. I wanted to, uh, you know, get involved. You know, I'm down here in Florida. I've been back from Afghanistan. You know, I worked for Fox, worked for CNN. Um, you know, I've been in the business 42 years. Me too. To, yeah, yeah, you and I. I'm you know, a, I make money. I anyway, I make I've been- money. Yeah, I've been a working journalist since 1978. If you include the five yeah, yeah. years, the five years yeah, that I, so. my beat, my beat was Constellation, was an aircraft carrier. I put out a daily right. newspaper and a monthly magazine and a daily newspaper, a daily uh, at sea uh, news program that yeah. Jack would have fit perfectly in because we we're always looking for volunteers for that. Turned them into shipboard celebrities. But uh, one of the things you talk about a transition from a, you know in, from the military into the civilian world, and Barry was talking about all the technologies. Well, one of the things that happened to me when I was in the Navy uh, was my first year at sea. Uh, we were typing in between blue lines and then sending it off offset press. They were just basically printing the stuff up. We went, came home, we came back, and they trained me in uh, you know onboard shipping in small arms and in pagination. Pagination was a brand new technology and we got it in some linear computer system and it was like magic. I could write something, type it, and the guys down in the print shop would get it. It was amazing. We would go, we would be running back and forth the four decks between the ships just to look at it, just to say, wow, something I wrote there just ended up down here. It was amazing. And that was 1979. That was long before when I first went, you know, when I when I did go to college, I went to college, went to the University of Wyoming, because all my friends were going there because they were still in the Navy Reserve, and if you were in the Navy Reserve, you were too far from the Navy if you're in Wyoming, so they got waivers so they could just go to college and not fulfill their reserve duty. But anyway, I went with a whole bunch of guys to my ship, so we were all together and we competed. We did well. I was outstanding graduate of Western Wyoming College because of my shipmates competing to get good grades and we we're a little bit older and smarter and wiser but I, we went to work for the in Laramie Wyoming for the Laramie Daily Boomerang as a sports writer my first official job as a college student I didn't work for the student newspaper I worked for the paper out in town and what I was dealing with in the Navy was years ahead light years ahead in technology they were still doing paste up and everything else I thought I was going back to the dark ages so sometimes when you're in the military, you get you get access to technology that is a that nobody nobody in the civilian world would give a 19 year old access to. They'd say you're crazy. <laughs> Don't let this guy have that. But I did. So that's one thing about you know the transition was is I had to wait for the civilian world to catch up with what I was dealing with, 
in the Navy. I was way ahead of the game in, in layout and design, and uh, which is not my strong skills, but uh, I, I, I could do all that stuff. The, off, the, the offset printing was, was way ahead. And, um, and, and, and because of that experience, I think that I've been able to, I mean, now Barry could disagree, <laughs> been able to, um, you know, kind of like constantly adjusting to new technologies, constantly. I mean, some of them I like, some of them I don't like. Some of them, as you get 45 years into a career, yeah. uh, you kind of are, you, you're going to do it this way. And that's the way it's, you know, some, I remember when uh, you made the first editor, you know, when, when Twitter was out and this and that, I had an editor, John Hackworth, who, who would go on to win a Pulitzer for uh, his editorial writing, but his management skills, managing new technology was a little weird. He wanted me to like, to be stepping out of a uh, new uh, stepping out of meetings and stuff to, to tweet what's going on in the meeting and I'm like well, well you got to wait for them to do something John <laughs> <laughs> you know don't say ten minutes I mean otherwise I'm gonna be out here like trying to you know like, do this twit thing whatever they call it instead of like and this is like nineteen you know ten new twelve years ago so I mean in other words so technology does pose but I think if you've been in the military a lot of times you're used to having all these things thrown your way. You're used to like having to deal with nonsense that makes no sense at all. So a lot of times as a reporter, I'm covering stuff that's nonsense that makes no sense at all. But, you know, I got to get that out there because this is what they said and this is what it is. <laughs> you know, you people can make up your own mind about that, but this is the official word. You know, getting the official word out, I think, is something also if you've been in the military, you know, you kind of understand that what your job is to get the official word out. You know what yeah. that means may not mean what what's real, but in other words, you you, you try to at least settle the get the the established story set so that everybody so, can rip it apart. With, with, I mean, without at least, have, at least you have that. Without uh, messing with host country sensitivities. Well, <laughs> in the I, military. I wasn't really worried about. It. I was uh, yeah. know, on an aircraft carrier. We weren't worried about host country. We we gave yeah. tours. That's about it. I, I did a morning show. Sailors out of their jails at sometimes, you know, but other than that, uh, you know, we weren't worried about host country sympathies. Or... Well, I did a, a morning show in Korea for three years. Ah. So uh, it was uh, always a worry, you know, got to make sure you don't say anything to uh, uh, make the nationals mad. And, the, you know, the nationals, they're not supposed to be listening sure. to you anyway, but they do. Of course they do. So uh, and that was good. Um, yeah, I will say, John, that uh, some of the equipment. Most trained killer. <laughs> I am yes. a chairborn, chairborn ranger. Oh no, AFN, <laughs> AFN, most trained killer. Chairborn ranger. AFN, 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 right? I was AFKN. AFKN, uh, AFN, yeah. Forces Korea. Yeah, um, but uh, some of that equipment that you uh, that was new and and awesome in the seventies, I was probably still using in the eighties. That's the same equipment that you got to use in the 70s. Well, so, it was brand new. My experience yeah. was a little different with the uh, the the, uh, the level of the equipment uh, than yours was. So, uh, I didn't deal much with broadcast journalists. As a matter of fact, we had yeah. for a couple of years just it was just me, one print journalist, and then you know on, on a command of five thousand guys, um, one print journalist. Period, and then they. Through in at one then my last cruise we had five journalists so you know <laughs> nothing made sense but right. uh, and we had a whole contingent I was the only print journalist they were all broadcast journalists so yeah we so all went to the same in, school in in at Fort Ben Harrison so okay. a lot of famous people John, went to that school sorry yeah. John and Len I do have a few uh, questions for you both okay so. What advice would you give to veteran journalists that are looking to get involved in community news? How can they use their experiences like a, a public affairs officer or a, an actual armed forces journalist? Um, how can they use that experience to transition into that? Well, every, uh, every civil agency has a public affairs officer or, or a public spokesperson. The sheriff's office, the Lakeland Police, uh, every single one uh, uh, has that. Uh, most major corporations also have a uh, like a, a department for that kind of thing. So if you're a public affairs officer in the military, that would be, an, I think, an easy transition. 
Um, what, I was a, a broadcaster in the army, and when it, when it was time for me to get out, I mailed out probably 70 tapes and resumes to radio stations all around the United States, and I heard back from two. Uh, so I don't think it's as easy now for military broadcasters to move right into civilian broadcasting as it used to be. But I, it, you know, if you're if you persevere and you're willing to do whatever it takes to get that job, uh, I think uh, that's uh, one of the keys. And as a military person, you know, that's kind of you know, army. They th they say uh, improvise, adapt, and overcome. So, you know, you you do what you got to do. And I slept in a tent at my. Uh, for, for the first few weeks of my first civilian television job. Uh, so uh, you got to do what you got to do. Uh, I, I think that's well, the, you, the best you, advice that I could give to someone. So Len, what was that job and what has your career progression been since then? Well, that was in Brunswick, Georgia. Uh, it was uh, first in Southeast Georgia, WBSG TV 21. Uh, it was a one-off family-owned TV station, very, uh, um, it's an unranked market. Uh, in fact, uh, their tower got knocked down by a storm and they just went dark. They never came back. So um, that was after I had stopped working there. But uh, uh, unfortunately for them, their tower went boo. Uh, uh, from there, uh, I went to college. I got a, a degree in mass communications from the University of South Florida. And then I got an internship at News Channel 8 in Tampa and as a photojournalist. And News Channel 8, NBC affiliate. And yeah, good I, station. Good at, station. The end, at the end of my uh, internship, uh, they had a part time editor job open. And so I took that and I did that for probably nine months in a full time news photographer job came open in Lakeland. And that's why I live in Lakeland now. I uh, bought a house in 1998 and moved here and uh, was for a year and a half the news photographer in Lakeland. And then a full-time editor job came open at the station. So I commuted between Lakeland and Tampa for nine years um, and edited the morning show and the midday show on Channel 8. Um, in 2008, the economy went to uh well let's just say that it died <laughs> <laughs> and uh uh you know the recession in 2008 killed a lot of local journalism jobs uh, we had a 150 person newsroom it went down to 75. Uh, they laid off our our whole section um of editors and they were bringing in photographers off the street to edit the the newscasts um and I got a part-time job at the radio station that I'm working at now, and uh, I have been hosting a, a morning talk show since 2012. And uh, I help out uh, Barry. I feel like I try to help out Barry, get the word out about Lake. And now he comes on the show once a week, and I call it Lakeland Now on the radio. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, Barry comes on, and we talk about what, what he's covering in town. And um, I, I think that's the thing about our community is uh, – First of all, everybody knows Barry, uh, so that that helps. <laughs> He's been here for for longer than me, even. I've been here since 1998. Um, but Trinity said over 30 years, but it's actually going to be 40 years in July. That's mm. true. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just living in denial that it's we're in the 2020s. Um, but I wanted to say something. I know I'm not a veteran, so I've never done this kind of a transition, but I have pivoted in my career several times now. And so some of the advice that I'd give, it, particularly for those younger vets, you know, who are coming out, is it's totally acceptable to, to have a resume built on your skill set more than your experience. Mm -hmm. Front load that resume with those skill sets, identify those skills that are really transferable to the career that you want, whether that's your you know, expertise with that broadcast equipment or your ability to embed within a community. And you know, that is something that I feel like, particularly those who've been in Afghanistan and Iraq and some of you know the more recent wars and less wars we've been fighting, you know, have been trained and have a lot of experience in doing is winning over locals' trust. And I think that's something that's very, very useful for our local news organization. 
Um, and then the other thing, and I, hopefully I'll make very happy in saying this, but I think no matter what type, what medium you're going into, whether that's, you know, a broadcast medium like television or radio or a digital medium, you have to have excellent writing skills, no matter what. Yeah, I would say. Yeah, so tell a story. Storytelling. You know, there are right now in uh, Poland and Romania, there are about a dozen Lakeland area patriots serving. Wouldn't that be a great story to tell a story of some of the military that's serving overseas right now? They're out there. Do a profile of uh, Grady Judd, the best sheriff in the nation. He, he's right I there. I think Grady Judd's a little bit been done many times. But Jack, if you got some contacts, uh, you know, got some contacts, uh, let's send them along. I'll, we'll, we'll do it. <laughs> We'd love to do it with the, with the Lakelanders in Poland and Ukraine. We'd do that. Exactly. Yeah, and then I started Divots. I don't know if you know what Divots is. Defense Visual Information Distribution. I started that when I was a colonel. And then I moved into contracting and then running stations. So there are stories that the Lakeland people want to hear about as long as it makes you know Lakeland. I get it. How many Lakeland got to? Well, it's basically you're you're saying hometown news situationally for this situation. Do a hometown news thing. The military has a hometown news program where you basically write a press release. And then they fill in the blanks of everybody. In other words, uh, they, you write a letter, you write a thing, and it goes to, it goes through the hometown news service. It's like you know somebody's being deployed. He's on a ship, constellation. We're being deployed. You send a press release out, and the hometown news service would fill in the blanks and send it to everybody's newspaper, you know, anywhere, and whether they published it or not. In other words, that was some type of automated system they had, where they could fill in the blanks because if people, the sailors, soldiers, marines would fill out a form saying, here's my hometown newspaper. And then they would send stuff to that hometown newspaper on these uh, aggregated press releases. I think, so, it's, important, I think some, it's important to note that when we went to school, when you go to school as a, a journalist uh, to the public information programs, the, the initial programs that you get, it's roughly three to six, it's, it's highly concentrated Highly, in other words, you get well, essentially the first year college level, first year news writing 101, news writing 102. I didn't have to go to any of those courses when I went to college. I mean, which is what I immediately did when I got out of the Navy. I got out of the Navy August 14th, was in class by August 28th. Um, I mean, right away, there was no transition. It was right in and out. And I went right there and I went right into school. And of course, I was fortunate. I was surrounded by people I knew in a, and, but we took over the, we, we basically took over the school newspaper after my first two years, took it right over, basically got rid of the poets, got rid of all this thing, started covering board meetings and start, and basically started running students for the school board. We were totally like, you know, insurgents. <laughs> we started running students. So he said, okay, let's get a student to run for the school board. We'll tell them what to do. If they're going to ignore us, we'll just have our own student. And we started doing that and things like that. Uh, but my beat, in other words, I was already a trained journalist who had four years, five years experience. So when I took over like the school newspaper, I mean, basically it just became a beat, a beat. And that you learn the same beat in DINFOs as you would learn just your beats a little bit different. The same skills, the same introductory basic journalism thing. And I rarely had any, the, the, the motto was maximum disclosure, minimum delay when something happened on board the ship. You, you, but you sent that to San Diego and where it went after that, I don't know. But I'm just saying, we never lied. We told people everything that was going on, uh, you know, officially you know, like this and that, because people were gonna find out, um, you know, some things didn't get out. <laughs> but we would, it would come out of our office and it would go to the fleet public affairs office and what they did with that, you know, who knew? But um, I'm just saying that it wasn't, there wasn't a lot of top heavy pressure censoring me it was the same type of beat that you know i was once i went to college there it was my first two years in rock springs wyoming at western Oregon college covering the school board covering my fellow students and then when i went to laramie i got a job being a sports writer with the with the newspaper and i my and, and i just that was my beat covering the basketball and football teams so so, so john i'm, I'm gonna be uh, aging myself a little bit when i was in college um 
the newspaper, the student newspaper was taken over by some returning Vietnam veterans who um, were all libertarians. And that was kind of interesting because the editorial policy of the paper went from traditionally, you know, early 70s student liberal to uh, conservative to very libertarian overnight for about two years. And then uh, I guess they graduated and <laughs> went back to students running it. But, I don't know uh, if I had a political philosophy until, you know, I mean, in other words, my political philosophy kind of like evolved as being a reporter. When I was a kid, I had, I had no idea what was going on. I mean, in other words, hey, so I ended up in the Navy. Um, you know, I didn't have any idea. I mean, you know, what, what, you know, any politics, it wasn't discussed around my house. There were issues here and there that would pop up, but my parents weren't really that engaged, I guess, in the, the broader scheme of things. They were too busy raising five kids and working. Um, you know, the politics was a lot simpler back in those days. And I never really had to like develop any type. I mean, only recently in the last 10 years, you know, has it gotten that way. And plus, you know, my career track has taken me all over the place to all sorts of different things. I've, I've worked in business publications in Manhattan. I've worked, uh, you know, for outdoor publications. I, I worked for Outdoor Life for years, covering, par you know, public lands, public lands and, uh, you know, a lot of that is because of the, my Wyoming experience, you know, at the University of Wyoming, I studied uh, the politics and administrative administration of environmental policy. By virtue of that, I got a Bachelor of Science degree in journalism, which means I always get anointed to be the guy covering like the complicated land use issues here in Florida, all the mosaic and the, you know, the phosphate lawsuits and, and, you know, now all the, I mean, I'm the least of the guy gets anointed to cover all these environmental issues because somehow I'm supposed to, I graduated from Wyoming, so I must understand it. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, in other words, my track is taking me along these, these ways. I mean, and, uh, you know, I, I deal with all sorts of publications now writing about all sorts of weird stuff. And, uh, you know, and I do parachute in. Sometimes it's good to be a guy who can parachute in. You know, to say because you're objective or not objective, but, you know, you're, nobody's objective the minute you're born. You're no longer objective. You can only try to be fair. The, uh, you know, I'm just saying I get parachuted into all sorts of weird situations sometimes because I, I'm, I'm here and I'm gone the next day. I see things that they don't <laughs> and I can say yeah. things yeah. they can't because I'm gone tomorrow. So uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm just saying, you know, in other words, uh, my, my military experience, you know, the Navy, which was the Navy, sometimes it's hard for me to say that's the military, it's the Navy. It's its, its own world. And uh, I mean, truly, it's its own world. And uh, yeah, they don't care what the Army and the Air Force are doing. It's immaterial. It's ir it doesn't matter <laughs> to us. I do, want to, I do want to pick up on something John said, and Trinity alluded to this already, but... Um, we are very, uh, one of our founding doctrines really is to be nonpartisan. And, uh, uh, you know, I talked about the, the political orientation at the college newspaper, and that was really the editorial page. We, we don't do editorials. We want to make sure that our readers see us as fair and balanced and that, uh, we, that we're not coming from any particular uh, viewpoint. Uh, I read one article earlier today that was a little bit dis discouraging, really, about the fact that with uh, so much partisan media these days, this they, they, they sort of conjecture was that more news organizations, and they really talk more on the, on the national level, but they were sort of conjecturing that more news organizations will be forced to, to choose sides. And it's uh, kind of sad to me that we don't have that uh, that sort of, uh, you know, Walter Cronkite uh, balanced uh, approach as much as, uh, as we used to. Definitely something that, uh, that I think is pretty essential to, to covering local news is, is being able to see all sides and hopefully represent all sides fairly. Um, you know, John had, well, yeah, I got confronted yeah. with a bit of a situation recently where, uh, you know, this group that's making a name for itself, Barry's familiar with them, making a name for themselves on a national scale. They just got to, right. you know, they're very proud of being uh, ripped by Media Matters as a right winger. Very proud of themselves. Uh, wanted to tell me something about the local elections here and, and blah, blah, blah. And I said, I am not going to write a story about accusations. I mean, in other words, if you give me something, I'm going to check into it. And so they called me to their office on Friday and they gave me something completely different about some school district that was, and I, I mean, in other words, told me like, oh, we got, we got some dirt in Polk County elections. I'm like, really? <laughs> and, uh, and I said, I'm not writing a story about 
accusations. I mean, I, I, in other words, and I think that that's something you really got to see newspapers and websites, unless they are partisans, you know, uh, I mean, blatantly being partisan, go back to journalism 101 and say, I'll take your accusations and your documents, but now I'm going to go and check them out. I'm going to go and, you know, the people that you're saying did all these horrible things. I'm going to check that out. Today, it's a race. In other words, these people are going to look for somebody else and they'll just put it out there. They say they're going to accuse everybody of all sorts of horrors without having to get rebuttal from the accused. And that's happening all over. And that's part of it is because of partisan reasons, but also part of it is technology related. In other words, if I don't do it, somebody else is going to do it. And let's get those readers and get those eyes on us rather than over there. So that's going to be a problem. And this, that's something you know that's happening. The nonpartisan aspect of this, it's something that informs our community engagement and also our donor strategy, uh, to be honest. It helps us fundraise in order to fund this organization. Um, we have donors across the political spectrum who do not agree with one another and still support Lakeland now. And you know, when we talk about the kind of events that we do and at the, our role as that facilitator of the conversation, it's part of why we're trusted with that, that we're trusted to bring disparate groups together and to have an intelligent and productive conversation. Last year, we actually did political forums, um, actual candidate debates, because Lakeland's in an interesting place where we are um, on the very edge of the Tampa media market. That's a much, much bigger you know, uh, media market. And so things like our city election are not gonna get like television coverage. You know, and then there's Hall Communications where Len works that has a couple of local talk radio station, uh, stations here, but there is not a dedicated broadcast to Lakeland. So we stepped in to kind of fill that role and, you know, uh, give people access to essentially unvarnished responses from the candidates so they could be more informed about a local off year election. And I think if we had something like an opinion page, if we were perceived as being more partisan, we wouldn't be trusted to do that. Right. And I wanted to pick up on something that Jack asked about earlier about how we get the word out. And uh, Trinity talked about some of the things we do with social media, Google advertising, et cetera. But we also uh, share information on other media. There's a, a local monthly magazine called LKLD that's the hashtag for Lakeland. And uh, each week we do um, 10 news briefs for them that's branded as Lakeland now. So uh, that's when we, we get them out. As Lynn mentioned, I spend about 10 minutes on Mayhem and AM every Monday morning, 7.38 AM. <laughs> and we have a good time, but, but, but we do get the word out that way. It's a great way to, let, to expand our audience to tell other people about what is going on with Lakeland now. Give them a different... Look, and I don't always go with the. I mean, when we're not talking news. about classic rock. It, well, we do that. <laughs> Lynn has this great habit of starting with some '70s song, and and most of the time I know what it is, and we kind of talk about that for the first thirty seconds ago. We had a really good one this week. Um, this week is the week of a really huge uh, air show, air exposition in Lakeland. The, Sun and Fun, used to be the Sun and Fun Fly, and now it's the Sun and Fun Aerospace Expo. It's a week long or almost week long, uh, pretty major event, 230,000 people expected this year. The U.S. Air Force Thunderbirds are, are going to be performing later this week. Anyway, because of that, the song that, uh, that uh, Lynn started off when I came on was Jet by, by Wings. So kind of a double pun. You had jets and wings for uh, Sun and Fun. Oh, that's kind of cute. Uh, oh, yeah. So, yeah, I'm happy to have Barry on. It's more like 15 minutes, but uh, uh, okay. it's okay. I mean, that's I'll, give you, I'll give you more time if you didn't have I to be at the Suffering city commission Jet. meeting. There you go. So we have a good time. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit of a wider view of the news, but occasionally again to, to have heavier things. Yeah, Sometimes. basically, <laughs> we're just, we just like to share what he's covering. Uh, because, you know, Lakeland is the target audience of my show and, uh, he, he, you know, and Barry is uh, covering Lakeland uh, on online and uh, in, in a very uh, responsible way, in my opinion. Uh, and, and, you know, and being a journalist, uh, I have to tell people all the time that when you look at CNN or you look at Fox News or MSNBC 
you're looking at editorials, you're looking at opinion pieces, you're not looking at actual journalism where people are presenting both sides of a story and not taking a side, not taking, you know, not injecting their own opinion. Uh, I've seen so many times where the reporter makes themselves part of the story and that's not journalism at all. And I think John would uh, uh, agree with me as well. And I know Barry would, so. And I think there are ways that our business model, the fact that we're a nonprofit, really do have a profound effect on the journalism. Um, you know, the reason we can have these kinds of partnerships with Hal Communications, with LK on D, is because we're not charging for the content. When you donate to us, you know, or you sponsor Lakeland Now, you are doing that because you believe in our mission. You're not paying for an article. And so it really does kind of invert the traditional business model. Um, and so it makes it easy to have all of that content be free. And then the other part of it too, is it puts the community really like, they are our stakeholders. They are the people that we are responsive to, not shareholders. <laughs> The, you know, the community stakeholders. And so some of the initial feedback I got when I first joined Lakeland Now from, you know, our readership was the fact that they liked that we don't try to make our headlines like sexy or emotive or, you know, it's like the headline is the headline. It just says what the article is about. You know, it is in, in a sea of, you know, a kind of social media outrage machine that's always trying to elicit an emotional response. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a break, which is really nice for people. And mm -hmm. so the, the irony is that was actually driving more click throughs than headlines that were, you know, written to try to drive click throughs through eliciting of you know, like a, a you know, dramatic emotional response well you know to, to me uh, the readers at the center of, of our coverage and that's one of the benefits of being being a nonprofit is we don't have to put the uh, advertiser experience first and one of the things that i know everybody gets driven crazy about with most newspaper websites is that there are so many pop-ups and um Oh gosh, um, videos that start playing when you're not expecting them to, and uh, just not really a lot of thought to the reader experience because they're so busy making sure that the advertiser experience is taken care of. Uh, one thing I've noticed lately where the, the local paper here is now owned by Gannett, and this is probably true throughout Gannett, is that a lot of the headlines now are written for uh, search engine optimization. So the beat they'll be written as a question, not the way you would ever traditionally write a headline if you're trying to impart what the story's about, but certainly there's a question that somebody might be searching for on, on Google or some other search engines. So um, it sort of subverts the whole, the whole process and takes the reader out of the middle of the coverage. And I really try to think uh, the whole time at a city commission meeting, my whole thought is, okay, what does this mean to the person out there who's not at this meeting, who doesn't really follow city government? Is this important? What are they going to get out of it? Why is this important to them? And if it's not, probably, we probably won't write it. Write it. Okay, I do have oh, one I'm question. I'm write sexy headlines. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. <laughs> I try. <laughs> Just more on how Lakeland News functions. Um, how often do you guys post articles? Do you post daily? Do you post a few times a day, once a week? Um, and then how do you see the future of community engagement in Lakeland? And how do you see Lakeland News kind of playing into that? Okay, good questions. Um, you know, because we are digital and we don't have a strict publication uh, schedule, we, we're not a daily paper that has a, that, that comes out every morning at 6 a.m., for example. We pretty much post when the story's ready or conversely, when I'm, when I'm finished editing it sometimes. Um, you know, in, in a typical day, it will be anywhere between one and five articles, really just depending on the news flow and what's going on. We've had four today and I don't anticipate anymore. Uh, uh, the rest of the day, as, as I mentioned, two were once we originated, two were, were curated art articles. Um, so and, and I kind of see, see that going on. One of the things that is kind of uh, kind of nice with having a few freelancers is I actually have a little, little bit of a backlog now. 
there's a few stories that don't have to be published right away that are another one or two that I've held on a little too long. So <laughs> one of these days, uh, John, I'm actually going to publish the thing about all that stuff going on on Lake Parker. It's what about two months old now. <laughs> we'll get it's it out. It's not today, right? I mean, uh, you know, we should be hearing from people today, I guess, or tomorrow. <laughs> it's, uh, you know. So, you know, we expected a lot of uh, pushback or feedback on our article about uh, duck hunting, and there's been some, but not as vitriolic as I thought it might be. Um, as far as future of community news, it's kind of interesting just the way things have been, been evolved in our town. Um, in addition to, to Lakeland now, I, I'd say that the two the main sources of sort of traditional hard news would be Lakeland Now, the, the daily newspaper. There's a certain amount that, that Lynn does on the radio station. Uh, the Tampa TV stations all have, for the most part, one reporter in Lakeland. In the case of the station that, uh, that Lynn used to work at, uh, WFLA, there's actually a full-time reporter and uh and videographer who live here, as well as a couple of people who come in from Tampa every now and then. Yeah. Uh, and one of their anchors actually lives here and moves to Tampa to, um, to, to, to do her anchoring. Um, so that's kind of a little bit of the, the, uh, the, the media landscape. It gets a little deeper in that there's a, a newsletter that has come in from out of town. It's the uh, organization 6 a.m. city that, uh, has been getting a little bit of attention lately. They've got um, morning news centers and about uh, 25, uh, actually I don't know if it's 25 yet. They started out with four or five and Lakeland was one of the first. They've got news centers that are more lifestyle oriented in uh, a lot of communities around the country. They, they do a lot of aggregation of news, a lot of light news. They don't, they kind of consciously avoid controversial things. They don't get very much at all involved in politics or crime. And, um, you know, my, my biggest issue with them is sometimes it is hard to tell what their own generated stuff is and what is being paid for by advertisers. There's a lot of sponsored mm -hmm. content. And you have to look really carefully to see what is sponsored versus what is their material. And I think to the average reader, it's going to be pretty opaque sometimes. Um, and the other thing is they've got some fairly young and experienced people. They're very energetic. They put out a ton of copy during the day, but because they do so much, quite often there, there's a lot of errors. And um, I just kind of wish they would sort of draw back. Um, we talked about newsletters earlier today. Interesting to me that another company that people have heard about doing local newsletters recently is Axios. National news organization, but they recently in the last year got into local newsletters. Uh, Tampa Bay was one of their first cities that they started out in. I think they started out in about five or six communities. One was Tampa, so uh, I get that one and I have a chance to look at it. They actually came from sort of the same beginnings as 6 a.m. City. They were both modeled after a uh, newsletter in Charlotte called the Charlotte Agenda. The thing I think it's kind of interesting about Axios is they hire two people just like 6 a.m. City does for each community, but they hire experienced journalists and they don't try to cram so much PR in every day. There's usually about six stories and maybe about four or five curated things. And uh, just the quality is consistently a lot higher. It does, doesn't, maybe not as long, but a little, a little bit more depth, and that's kind of funny to say because they don't really do depth reporting, but they, they do the kind of thing where it's short, but very, but the writing's very tight and impactful. So um, anyway, I know I got a little bit off topic, but um, in terms of the media landscape, uh, gosh, I mean, I, I hope that uh, that real news reporting continues to be um, part of the the scene here, I know a lot of people with uh, independent news organizations like my own are very competitive with the local newspaper and quite often, um, you know, uh, down on the local newspaper. And there are some things that I criticize them about, but I would love to see them be able to hire more reporters. I'd like to see us be able to hire more reporters. I mean, I think a community thrives on 
getting as much uh, information to citizens as possible. So the more reporting, the better for the community. And, you know, so I hope we can, can grow. I hope the, the newspaper can grow. I'd love to see um, uh, the TV stations do even more in Tampa. I'd love to see uh, uh, Lynn's stations, uh, you know, be able to get back into uh, to having, uh, you know, full-time news director. Maybe a different one. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, we, uh, 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 it's funny you say that. Um, yeah, I'm the only news person at the radio station now, and I curate my news. Uh, I in the old days that the TV news anchors, uh, the way they would deliver the news, they would pull out the local paper and read stories out of the paper. Well. Uh, I use Barry, I use the local paper, I use the local TV stations. And basically, I'm, I'm just writing headlines because I put four stories in a minute and, uh, uh, and I call it a news brief. So uh -huh. as far as doing news, um, I'm putting it on four radio stations, um, but right. it, it's not, it, I'm not going out and getting the news. I'm just uh, curating it and you know, attributing when I need to use attribution. Uh, I, I'll use like press releases and things like that as well uh, when I get those. But I mean, it, it's hard to tell a who, what, when, where, why, and how in 15 seconds. Um, and that's like the max I have for one story. Uh, so basically it's a, uh, this happened and why or how, you know, so I, I'm not hitting all of the, the, the answers when I'm doing my news, but I, t I can get a little bit more in depth. I, I like to, when I bring Barry in, uh, we talk about news. Uh, I, Sheriff Grady Judd comes on my show twice a month. And of course, we always talk about news with him and uh, you know what kind of things the sheriff's- We get the mayor too. Yeah, the mayor comes on. Uh, the mayor of Lakeland comes on my show once a month. And uh, you know, we, I, I, I try to keep local stuff on the show because it's a local radio station. Um, and, and before the pandemic, I had in local musicians once a week would come on and play live every Friday. So, you know, it, it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's really how I try to keep my broadcasting engaged with the local community. Well, you know, and, and when I was a young reporter, I learned a lot from uh, listening to the radio uh, reporters. They would do their, you know, I'd hear, the, hear them do their, I guess they don't call it standups, but I'd hear them record their, uh, their, their, their bits. And I was really impressed by how they were able to very tightly get a lot of information in uh, not a whole lot of words. And I, it's something that I think I've tried to, to do with our curation of news. Um, you know, today we had I curated three three articles from the ledger, and I'd like to think that uh, a lot of times our curation is a lot more direct and to the point and punchier than uh, than, than the way it was written in the uh, you know the original source. Because I do want to get to the point quickly and get in and out, and I want to spend a lot of time um, doing what might be what might look like copying them, or it's one of sort of get to the important parts quickly and uh, and compactly. I kind of want to take a different take on this question if I, if I can for a minute. You know, um, from an academic kind of point of view, if you look at like the UNC study on the news deserts and the loss of local news and all the amazing work that they've done, we know that in places where the local newspaper has disappeared completely, you know, or being served by a ghost newspaper, we know that there is a massive loss in civic, civic engagement. Voter turnout goes down, fewer people run for office, you know, so I just want to say, Part of what I loved about Lakeland now from the get-go is our mission is to cultivate civic engagement. We just, that is, that is our why, that's why we do this, that how we do it is through local journalism. So it really kind of front loads that public good that local news can do. And when we talk about the future of that, you know, for us, the beauty of being, you know, of the digital technology and, and, and all, all the different you know platforms that we can do is as long as it fills that mission, you know we can go in a multitude of different directions. And I think the challenge for us is going to be focusing and growing strategically as we do that. Yeah, 
Um, but I, I am very optimistic and hopeful. You need funding, funding. That's the name of the game. No money, no honey. Yes, the money's always on my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead, if nobody else has anything to add, I'm going to go ahead and open the floor for questions. Um, if anybody has anything they'd like to ask, feel free to unmute and go ahead and ask it. One question, and I think maybe if you look at two websites, it might get you really excited about where to go in the future. Look at RSBA, it's Right Side Broadcasting Network, and look at real America's Voices website. Now, don't look at them in terms of what they're sending out. Look at the template. Look what they've done. They started a web streaming, and they're getting big funds, donations, and of course, it's conservative. Again, don't look at you know the editorial. Just look at the template and look at what they're trying to accomplish there. They're getting heads. They're getting clicks, and this could be the future for a way for them. Do something like that to drive people to come to your website, to your newsletter, to your gathering of information. Because right now, frankly, I don't tell you, I know nothing about you, and I'm on the internet, especially now because I'm back in Afghanistan, at least 10 hours a day, at least. Jack, uh, I'm having trouble hearing you. Would you mind putting the links to those sites uh, in the um, in the, the chat? So, because uh, I would like to check them out, but but it, there's a little bit of feedback and it's hard to hear. Yeah, because I'm still walking. You know, I, I was exercising, so I apologize. Yeah, Jack was the first person. Jack was jogging back in the late '70s when nobody else was. <laughs> he was jogging around the neighborhood. Everybody thought he was nuts. <laughs> <laughs> I'm jogging yeah, now. Doing it. I'm, I'm jogging with a rubber suit. People think I'm crazy, but guess what? My weight is Sugar Ray Leonard's weight, and I'm 63 years old. Well, that's that's what he was doing in 1977, too. <laughs> 77. Okay. Yeah. Yes. I was learning to walk. 76. <laughs> yes. Jack and I grew up two houses from each other in Monroe, New York. Our mothers were best friends. It's kind of weird. <laughs> so at the end of the day, you got to get viewers. you got to get clicks. Let's, let's call it to the chase. Without that, we're going to be trying to survive month to month. If you can do that, you'll be successful. I can help. I'm retired. I got other opportunities. I'm not looking for a buck. I'll help you guys if you want to help. Appreciate it. Where do you live, Jack? You don't live in Lakeland, do you? Oh, I live Champions Gate. Champions King? What's that? Oh, Champions Gate. Champions Gate, yeah. yeah it's pretty close. Outside of very close. In fact, in fact I'm my BMW. Park. Come on by. <laughs> I will. Let's set up a meeting. Thanks. So... I think uh, one of the takeaways I get is, you know, is engagement is, is really, you know, if you follow journalism 101, it lays out a footprint of engagement. I mean, the initial tier is to basically hit all the, uh, all the public agencies and public meetings that you can attend. You see who's there, you see who's talking, you, you, they see you, you basically make inroads in the community through those people. And then, you know, you, you have to have your ears and eyes open listening. I, I happen to have friends, you know, I mean, I'm not, I mean, I'm pretty much here stuck in Lakeland, stuck in here, right here, almost all day and all night. But I got all sorts of people out there all day who report all sorts of things to me. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, well, I never, Lakeland is fantastic. I to, Lakeland is I, a fantastic I myself, place. Nice but uh, I, I have friends. You know, and you talk about musicians and some of the things going on in town. I, I, I know a lot of that. I know a lot of, you know, I know a lot of the area's musicians pretty well. But, um, you know, and that's always Lakeland. exciting. That's a whole venue. That's a whole venue of engagement with people right there. I mean, in other words, there's all cir circles of people that you can network and, and pull in to the grand sphere of things. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you can hit if you're yes, a veteran. Like 
you can, you, if you're a veteran, you can hit the American Legion, the VF, especially now that it's open to all veterans instead of VFW and, and just have an ear. You can find out issues that are going on, not just nationally, locally, but you know, like national issues that are bothering veterans, which is like concurrent receipt, things like that. In other words, you, you get your benefits from the military, but then they can take them away if you're somehow getting similar benefits through the, you know, through, through your in, uh, insurance program for your employer or something like that, you know, and sometimes it's not equitable. Sometimes you'd rather go to the VA rather than to some other doctor and they're denying you that because you, in other words, there's a lot of unfairness that, that are not sexy issues that, that, you know, don't grab headlines, but these are the issues that, you know, I've been going to VFWs and American Legions for a quarter century and hearing about, hearing about, hearing about, and uh, why, why can't they galvanize enough political support to get at least that done? I mean, there've been some things done. So, you know, you find out about all, I mean, the duck hunting crisis in Lakeland. I mean, look, there's a yeah. whole new community of people that we've uh, engaged and uh, who will be engaging back. <laughs> And uh, so, so every issue has its has its this and that. Right now, the biggest the biggest constituency in uh, Lakeland is people who get who drive who get in their cars. The roads are <laughs> hellish, right. and and that's the one big common bond everybody has. They hate the roads, they hate the traffic, they hate the growth and development, and that's the big thing right now. Everybody's on board with that. That includes everybody. So that's you, anything you write. I think we're going to write a story about this one program where it's that is basically Lakeland, Lakeland unique about this traffic light program. And it's unique to Lakeland. Nobody else on the planet has it. And uh, which I confirmed today. They're very excited. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> that's going to be, I mean, you, you say traffic lights in car, you know, traffic intersections, road, and you've got eyes. That's it. That's like, you want to, that's a sexy headline that has traffic and intersection in it right there. All eyes are on it. So that's a constituency that we're uh, engaged with on a regular basis. Go so, do a story. Go do a story on Ray Lewis. He grew up in Lake. He went to. Uh, you know, Harry we can do a story on how Ray Lewis abandoned all the Ray Lewis little football yes. leaguers here in town. Okay, where's Ray Lewis? He's not around. Oh, no, but you know, he see, started a football, little football program, and uh, you know, I was going to be there uh, at least visit once in a while, and uh, that thing just disappeared, and nobody knows what's happened. So, I know um, him. I'll, I'll reach out right, to him. Hey, buddy. I'm sure hey, we'd love to have a story on Ray Lewis and Grady Judd, but we'd rather have a story on the in the guy in Lakeland who's in Poland or Ukraine. Get us one of those guys. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If we can, if we can talk to that's one of the easy. people in Poland or Ukraine, that'd be great. Yeah, that's easy. That's, that's easy. That's easy. All right, you're hired. Hook <laughs> us up. Jack Pagano. I'm going to put it on Facebook. Yes. Jack Pagano is joining Lakeland now. <laughs> he doesn't live in Lakeland, but neither does if Ross, if Ross and Toledo can run for the congressional district that now doesn't exist, but soon will. And neither one of them live in it. Jack, you can work for us at Lakeland now anytime you want. That's right, <laughs> April 22nd. Uh, this governor sub submits me uh, to the legislature the new session to make the jury and the districts April 22nd. Well, they might not be, they, they start the 19th. They probably will be done by the 20th. That's the way they operate. They already have everything down. They already know which way they're voting. So I'd get there on the 19th. Okay. Yep. Yep. I, does anybody else have any questions for the folks at Lakeland now? Okay. We are the folks at Lakeland now here. <laughs> <laughs> if nobody else has any questions, then um, I think we can go ahead and end it here. Um, well, thank, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we really appreciate you guys joining us for this webinar. And thank you to our thanks. members who joined us as well. We will see you guys at the next event. Thank you for inviting us. I appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to thank see you. Bye-bye. See you, Bear. See you, Trinity. Hi, Lynn. Bye. Bye. Hi, John. Bye-bye.